So thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Keith Neustadt, and we're going to be talking about Keystone Security. Um, before I get started, how many people are somehow involved in the security field? It's pretty good. Pretty good. All right. Uh, and how many people are pretty familiar with Keystone while I'm at it? All right. Great. Sorry about that. So before I get started, I, I want to start by saying that there's a lot of really good information out there uh, in the community on this topic. And I would recommend that everybody start by reading the OpenStack Security Guide. There's really good information in there. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the com community has, already recent, uh, has also recently done a threat model of Keystone. And uh, that's out there as well. So it's pretty interesting reading. Uh, I would also like to point out that uh, everybody's deployment, everybody's use of Keystone is going to be a little bit different. Everybody's environment is a little bit different. So it can be hard to come up with a boilerplate recipe or checklist, set of rules of what you need to do to make sure that you are secure. Um, security is really uh, a mindset. Uh, and a process. And so we thought it would be interesting to share with you guys our process and the things that we've been thinking of as we at Symantec um, go through the process of deploying Keystone into production. So before I get started, I just want to give you a, 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 some context of you know, what it is that, that Symantec is doing. We are building um, a very large cloud for Symantec. We're building the next generation Symantec cloud that all of our products and services are going to be deployed on. Uh, and it's a really exciting project. It's a, a greenfield project all the way up from brand new data centers up to the infrastructure and platform services. Uh, and we're heavily committed to OpenStack. So again, multiple data centers, um, thousands of nodes. And our approach is that we're going to use OpenStack in every way that we can. And in areas where we have needs that um, we don't find yet in OpenStack, we're going to build in features. Uh, we might build entirely new services. We're going to contribute all of that back to the community. So I'll give you a, a quick example. Um, in partnership with Mirantis, we have started a new OpenStack service called MagnetoDB, which is a NoSQL database as a service. And as a matter of fact, we've got a design session tomorrow on that. So if anybody's interested in that, I invite you to come. And you can also talk to me after the presentation. So again, I'm Keith Neustadt. I've been in security for uh, coming up on 15 years. Um, I was recently the architect for uh, the various Norton web services. And that includes the Norton Identity Provider, which is in a lot of ways very similar to Keystone. Uh, these are you know, fairly large-scale services. We handle billions of requests a day, uh, north of 100 million users, and also north of 100 million endpoints. Uh, and being semantic, we are a really attractive target. Um, people like to go after us. And so we are basically constantly under attack. And sometimes it's a low level of attack. Uh, and sometimes those attacks kind of ramp up. But they're always happening. And, and um, we definitely understand uh, security from a practical production sense. So I've now moved on to, again, to, to cloud platform engineering, building the next generation semantic cloud. Uh, but this presentation just isn't just about me. There's a, a larger team at Semantic that worked on this. Um, I can see some of those folks in this room. Uh, so if you see people wearing a Semantic shirt like this one in the hallway, feel free to pull them aside and say hi, ask me any questions you've got. Now, I know that most of you guys have a pretty good sense of what Keystone is. But to kick us off, I really wanted to you know, just start with a really brief um, overview of, of what it is and how it works. Keystone is OpenStack's identity provider. Right? This is the thing that allows you to, to log in that, that identifies your users. And here's how it works. The user goes to Keystone and authenticates using some form of credentials like a username and a password. Keystone then responds with some sort of an identity token that says that I, Keystone, 
vouch for this person. They are who they say they are. And now that user can go and take that identity token to any other service in OpenStack and use it to authorize themselves with that, that service. Uh, the service might validate the token itself using something like PKI, or it might pass that token through some back channel to uh, Keystone to get validated, for example, with UUID tokens. Um, but uh, either way, this is, this is really good stuff. This is a, it's a very simple pattern, but it's a pretty powerful pattern. It gives you a lot of things. For example, it gives you one point for authentication for all of your services. So your users um, always know where to go. They always have the same REST interface. They always know how to authenticate. And when they authenticate once, they're authenticated to all of the services inside of OpenStack. There's a common API layer that you need to put on top of all of your authentication protocols. It doesn't matter if you're using LDAP or MySQL or something else. And here's, I think, the most important thing is that it reduces the exposure of your credentials, right? Because rather than passing your, you know, your users passing your, their credentials to every single service, they only pass them to Keystone. Keystone is the only service that gets to see the credentials. And we all know that the credentials are very important. It gives us a place to focus our efforts in securing those credentials. And of course, Keystone does a lot more than that. But uh, for the purpose of the pre this presentation, I'm going I'm to focus on this flow. So here we are, we're all gathered together to talk about OpenStack and security. Why are we focusing on Keystone? Why is Keystone so, so critical? Uh, and the answer comes from basically looking at the assets. Right? If we look at OpenStack and we look at the assets, we see things like passwords, keys, certificates, tokens. And Keystone is basically the gatekeeper for OpenStack. Um, and if you can get through that gate, you have a lot of access inside of OpenStack. And these things we're talking about, they're keys to the gate. They're basically keys to the kingdom. So if these things are stolen, that's a big problem. And also, if somebody wanted to DOS your OpenStack uh, uh, infrastructure, this would be a good place to start, right? Because if you can shut the gate, then you've shut down access to a lot of OpenStack. So for Semantic, as we determine that Keystone is particularly important, um, we start to look at how we're going to secure it. And we have a tendency to look at things in layers, right? So for example, we'll start by looking at our process for securing Keystone. And then we'll start to look at our environment where we're going to deploy and run it. And then finally, we look at the application itself and figure out how are we going to secure that application, how are we going to secure Keystone. Um, so I'm going to use this as kind of a framework to go through the presentation. And we'll start with process. Now, uh, security to a large extent is about learning to uh, ask the right questions. And so I thought it would be fun to share some of the questions that we're asking ourselves as we're going through this process of securing Keystone. And the first question you tend to ask yourself when securing anything is, what is it that I'm trying to protect? What are my assets? Where am I deploying? And where am I likely to be attacked? And we use uh, the security development cycle, uh, life cycle as our security process. Um, there's others out there. That's the one that we've chosen for us. Uh, and that's a pretty broad topic. I'm not going to talk about all that, but I do want to talk a little bit about one aspect of it, which is threat modeling. So who, who here has done threat modeling, has had experience with threat modeling? OK, a few. So uh, threat modeling is cool. It's really cool. It's a lot of fun, actually. It takes us away from that typical perspective of how do I secure what I have? And it flips it around and allows us to take the perspective of uh, how would I attack what I have if I wanted to do that? And this is a really important exercise, because the fact is, is that if you don't do it, your attackers are going to anyway, right? So you might as well know what they're thinking. And uh, we're right now going through the process of threat modeling, Keystone, and OpenStack as we're going to deploy it for ourselves. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the community is already working on, on uh, some of those activities, and, and we're actually getting involved in those uh, threat modeling activities with the community, too. Uh, but I just wanted to, to pick just one, just to give you a sense of how this works, one little snippet of a potential uh, keystone threat model. So up here in the top, you've got a user who's logging in. They're passing their credentials into a trust zone um, for a keystone. And eventually, those credentials find their way to the LDAP driver. And the LDAP driver passes those credentials to the LDAP server. 
LDAP server authenticates them, sends back the user's ID, maybe some roles, other information. So it's a pretty straightforward interaction. And now that we've got that interaction understood, mapped out, we can apply Stride to it. And Stride is an acronym for different categories of attacks that somebody might launch against you. So let's take an example and see how this works. What would happen if somebody tried to spoof the LDAP server? Maybe they got into the network, some DNS attack, and they were able to replace our, DNA, our um, LDAP server with a fake one of their own. And what could they do? Well, they can see all the user credentials. Every user that logs in, they can see the, that username and password, right? And those are the keys to the gate. It's the keys to the kingdom, right? They could also elevate privileges. They could look for certain users, and they could pass back additional roles if they saw them. Right? So this would be a very powerful attack that we find from this very simple uh, interaction. So we ask ourselves, now that we understand the attack and we understand what's at stake, how do we mitigate it? And the answer when it comes to spoofing usually comes down to some kind of authentication. How does the um, LDAP client authenticate the LDAP server? And you know that's likely maybe through TLS and server-side uh, certificates, for example. Am I running what I think I'm running? Did I get the right distros? And even if I got the right distros, is, is it the same thing that I actually deployed into, uh, into, into production? Or did somebody inject something malicious into it? And am I running the right patches? So this is pretty st uh, standard stuff. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about this. But I, I do want to call out that since this process of getting the distros, building the distros, deploying the distros, since it's not production, sometimes we have a tendency to overlook it. Uh, and I'll give you an example. There's a story that a friend of mine told me recently uh, about a previous job, a previous place where he worked. And um, at this place, they had their CICD server as a machine sitting underneath somebody's desk. And they realized that they had a physical security issue with this server because Every once in a while, somebody would sit down at that desk, and they would cross their legs, and they would kick that big power button on the front of the machine, and they would basically DOS themselves unintentionally. So in realizing that they had a physical security issue, they went to mitigate it. They took a Snapple cap, and they taped it on top of the power button, and now no more DOS attack. Right. So again, I, have, I think we have a tendency to think, since it's not production, and I don't really have to worry about it, but if that machine can basically be shut down, if you've, if you've lost physical security of that machine, what else is going on in that machine? What else could somebody do on that machine? You know, maybe what I'm deploying to production isn't really what I think it is. Let's go on to environment. Is my system hardened against attacks? Once I've deployed, could somebody change it? What could somebody steal from it? And after it's happened, do I know what happened? Can I figure out what happened after the fact? So this is really about compliance. And we're talking about you know, two sides of the same coin with hardening and auditing. Right? And you're looking at how do you harden the important config files, log files, the ports, executables, your environment itself, so that they can't be changed, um, or at least that they can't be changed or read by uh, anyone who shouldn't be. Uh, and then since all of these things are going to be changed eventually and, you know, when it's appropriate, how do you audit those events? How do you know who changed it, when they changed it, what they changed? Uh, so uh, in terms of Keystone, I'll go back to it. Every Keystone deployment is a little bit different. And so the process of hardening and auditing it, you know, exactly what it is that you need to harden, it's going to be different for everybody. But what I'd recommend is that everybody start with the keystone.conf file. Uh, open it up and read it from top to bottom. And I think the first thing that you'll find is that there's really good stuff in the keystone.com file. If you wanted to steal something, that would be the first place that you would go because there's admin passwords, there's keys, there's ports, there's locations to other files like your cert files, your CA files, your key files, there's all sorts of really good stuff in there. So you certainly want to make sure that that is hardened and audited. Um, but you can also use it as a trail. You can just follow the trail from the keystone.conf, because it tells you where all of the other assets um, related to Keystone are on your system. And while you're at it, you might want to think about changing those default locations, because you don't want to make it too easy for someone who manages to get on the Keystone system to find all that stuff. Change the default ports, change the default file locations. 
In terms of compliance, um, there's a lot of tools out there. Semantic happens to make one. Uh, and so that's what we're using is uh, data center security. It kind of automatically goes out there and makes sure that you've hardened Linux. Uh, and they're also working on, key, on uh, OpenStack policy. So also goes out there and makes sure that you've hardened uh, OpenStack. Um, but you don't have to use our tools. There's other tools out there. A lot of people use SE Linux. They use Tripwire, things like that. So just you know, pick a tool and, and go with it. Is my data secure while it's in motion? What high value assets am I sending out in the wire? And what would happen, what would be the repercussions if somebody managed to intercept those? And I think you know, this is an important one. How much of my environment do I really trust? I think we have a tendency to think of our environments as everything that's inside is trusted and good, and everything that's outside is untrusted, and we don't know. Um, but the reality is the way these attacks happen is they get a tiny little foothold into your environment. And then from there, they slowly drill their way in. So you have to ask yourself, how much do you want to or do you even need to trust some of these internal parts of your environment? So now when we talk about data security in motion, I think we probably all agree you know, we're talking about SSL. Right? And we, I think we, hopefully we all agree that SSL is important. We should be using it. Um, but I want to point out that it's not just about SSL, but how you use it. So let's go through an example. Uh, up here at the top, we've got a client that's logging in. They're passing credentials down to Keystone. And as you can see, those credentials are completely unprotected through the internet, so we're going to add SSL, and now that path is good, and they're protected on that path. But again, we're not talking about just attack vectors on the public internet. Um, there are also attack vectors internally. What happens if somebody manages to uh, compromise a process that's running on one of your OpenStack servers? Or what if you happen to have deployed something that's not OpenStack, maybe it's a monitoring application, or maybe there's some sort of web service that you deployed either intentionally or maybe unintentionally on the same subnet. Well, you can see that after that SSL termination, those credentials are in the clear. And anybody who's on that subnet can see those credentials. And those credentials are the keys to the kingdom, right? So the way we're dealing with this at Symantec is we're going to push those SSL uh, endpoints down to the OpenStack servers. And then we know that credentials are always, all right. Very small round of applause. So, um, so now we know that all the credentials are always, in every case, they're encrypted. They're never on the wire without being encrypted. Um, but there's cost to this, right? And you have to kind of assess your own risk and your own cost and figure out what you, what you need to do. Um, now you've got issues and you know, things like deployment of certs, um, uh, you know, deployment of these endpoints. Maybe it affects your ability to use hardware load balancing and, and SSL termination. So you have to think about what works for you. Um, but at the very least, think about the, any clear text network that your Keystone server is on and think about segregating it. Now onto Keystone. Will I know when I'm under attack? And you've got to assume that it's going to happen. Who's attacking me? How are they attacking me? What are they after? And do I know how to stop them? Do I know that I can stop them? So there's two sides of this point also. There's prevention and there's forensic. How, do I, how resilient is my environment in production against these kinds of attacks? And then after the attack happens, do I have the information I need to figure out what happened and maybe what was lost so I know what I need to do to remediate? Now, again, working on the Norton Identity Provider, we were always under attack and we saw the kinds of attacks that, that tend to come to us. And for the most part, with an identity provider, you're going to see a lot of brute force attacks. They're looking for those passwords, and they're going to try to use your service to try to guess those passwords, running through dictionaries, things like that. So when looking at how you foil a brute, for a brute force attack, you need to slow it down. So you need to look at things like rate limiting, because if you can prevent these attacks from making thousands of requests per second against your identity service, um, you're basically going to disable the attack. It's the only way they work. The other thing you might want to ask is, is this a, a human user? Is this a real person that's, that's making these requests, or is it an automated process? Because again, these brute force attacks don't work if they can't use automation. So there are certain challenges you could send back, like CAPTCHA. You need the ability to be able to black, blacklist uh, bad IPs. You know, maybe um, you've determined that traffic you're seeing from a particular IP is bad, you want to blacklist it, or maybe you get a feed from somewhere, but you need to be able to block certain IPs. 
And then, you know, the other thing that, that we started to do is sort of to look for anomalous patterns, right? Anomalous patterns in logging in, but also maybe anom anomalous patterns in how uh, users use your, your uh, applications. So maybe you're seeing a lot of users from the same geographic area log in and follow a, a particular and unusual pattern through the other services. Maybe that's an indication that, again, you've got somebody coming from a particular area that's, that means you harm. And then after the attack, you need to make sure that you, you've got the data that you need to figure out what happened. Uh, and that's a lot of data. It's things like users that logged in, users that failed to log in, maybe hashes of the tokens you gave out and so you can track them through other systems. You want the source IP addresses. You need to pull all those logs into a central location where you can do some heavy-duty analytics and correlation. And then finally, you need to realize that all this information that you've collected, that has value too, right? You're tracking things like users' uh, patterns through the day. Maybe you can figure out when they get up, when they go to bed. You certainly know where they are geographically. So you've created this new, very highly, uh, uh, highly valuable asset that somebody might want to steal, and so it's something new that you need to figure out how you're going to protect. So uh, Keystone includes a lot of you know, really good logging. We're looking into that. Um, but if there's other information that you need to collect, uh, and certainly to be able to, to support um, things like rate limiting and challenges, uh, there's a couple of options. You can build a filter for Keystone. Um, you can add a proxy. Uh, there's some you know, load balancers, hardware load balancers that offer layer seven um, rate limiting. So you can look at other options like that. So is my user validation effective? Is it working? Am I really determining that my users are who they say they are? Are passwords enough? And if they're not enough, what other kinds of authentication should I support? And how should I implement it? So we're really, we're talking about two-factor two auth here, right? Everybody knows how two-factor auth works, right? I log in, I have to provide a one-time password that gets texted to my phone, or I've got some sort of a fob or something like that. So if you don't have my phone, but you have my password, you still can't log in. So two-factor auth for Symantec is really important. We're gonna have two-factor auth in production. So we start to go out and we look at options for how we support that with Keystone and OpenStack. And um, we see a couple of common deployment scenarios for authentication. For the most part, people either use the LDAP driver to hook up to an LDAP server, or use a SQL driver to hook up to a MySQL database to do the authentication. And from what we've seen, we don't see a solution that works for us for two-factor. Uh, and so when we look at this diagram, we think about how, how would we want it to work? Really what we'd ideally like is a RADIUS driver. A RADIUS is a, a low-level authentication protocol that's supported by a lot of different authentication servers that are out there. And so once you have this RADIUS driver, you've got choices for what you're gonna use for your back-end authentication. You can use RSA, Symantec has a solution. There's all sorts of open source authentication servers that support RADIUS. Now once you've got that choice, you can go out there and you can pick something that supports two-factor. And we happen to have something, but again, there's other options that are out there. So this is, this is what ideally we would like, and, and actually in talking informally to some other people in the community, we kind of get the sense that this driver might have been implemented by others before, but just not shared, not open sourced. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna look for an implementation that seems to work, or if it's not out there, we'll partner, or we'll build it ourselves, but whatever we'll do, whatever we do, we'll share. So how do my services and scripts authenticate themselves. Uh, I think that a lot of the time when we think about authentication, we think about the case where the user is sitting down at the computer and they're typing in their password, right? And we know how the credentials are secured, right? They've got them up here in their head, and hopefully they're not writing them down on the sticky note or they're telling their friends or uh, whatever it is. Um, so it's pretty straightforward, but there are, t there are times when Machines need to be able to authenticate themselves when there isn't a person around to help them do it. For example, OpenStack services authenticate themselves with Keystone. And there are clients out there that might need to authenticate themselves with Keystone. Right? Maybe it's a cron job that uh, does a health check, or maybe it's a deployment right, that needs to authenticate itself so it can run some sort of script. 
And so in looking at these kinds of user scenarios, um, we think about a couple of things. So first of all, since we're assuming, since there's no you know, human that's got the credentials in their head, that there's some sort of credential that's being cached on those machines. And so how do you secure those? Particularly given the fact that some of these machines, they're not owned by us, they're owned by our customers, you know, on their phones or on their laptops. And how do you, how do you, how do you limit the damage that can be done if they're stolen? Like how do you limit the scope of access that these things have? Um, or the amount of time they might live? And, uh, Finally, the management of those. Like, if you're talking about things like keys, where do you store all those keys in a central place so that they're protected, and how do you distribute them in a secure way? So in a sense, what we're really talking about is we're talking about delegation. Right? I'm, I'm, I've got a certain amount of access, and I want to delegate some small portion of that access for some limited amount of time to some machine so it can act on my behalf in a limited way. So we looked at some of the different potential solutions that's available with Keystone. We started with cache passwords, which I think is where most people start, and I think we know why that's a problem. We looked at the EC2 key, which is a little bit better than cache passwords, um, but just a little bit, because if you steal the EC2 key, you've got all the same access right. You almost might as well have the password. And we looked at trusts, which is a lot closer. Uh, it does a lot of the things that we're looking for. You can log into Keystone. You can ask for a delegation uh, to give to a certain user um, with a certain scope and a certain amount of time. And now that other user can act on your behalf. But where we get stuck is that I can only delegate to another user, which means there has to be a user that's logged into these other machines, which means that these machines need to have cache credentials. And those cache credentials also have scope. Uh, then there's other solutions like keys and certificates, and now you get into manageability issues. Right, so we're, this is something that we're still looking at about how we want to go about this. Um, and we'd be interested in hearing if there's other people out there that are asking these same questions of themselves and what you guys are thinking. And then finally, um, I want to just make a, a comment about standards. Uh, so in the Norton Identity Provider, we started in a similar place where you know, Keystone did, which is it's a REST API, um, uh, something that's proprietary that you can use to log in for single sign-on, get tokens. And um, we eventually took a step, ba step back and we decided that it was important for us to support industry standard protocols. Uh, and so we did that. We made that migration. And I'll tell you, it was hard. It was not easy. Um, because we had lots of clients, hundreds of, you know, hundreds of millions of clients out there that used our old protocol. And we were moving them to something new and something web-based, so it's not easy. But we decided that it was important because it had specific benefits. So let's say that Keystone supported identity, pro uh, identity standards. You could log in um, single sign-on to not just OpenStack, but to maybe Google Apps, maybe Salesforce, so you get broader single sign-on. You get some improved integration, both when you're bringing new services into your OpenStack environment, but also if you wanted to integrate external identity providers like, like Google or Microsoft. Um, there's actually a little bit more control over the credentials in these protocols. And you also get a, a unified, not just API, but a us unified user experience for logging in. So your users know what the login page looks like. They're familiar with the, um, with the graphics. And uh, whoever's running that identity provider has a lot of ability to add new features to it, you know, multi-factor, retina scan, security questions, identity proofing, things like that. So there's a lot of benefits. Um, we're not the only ones that brought this up. There's a lot of discussion going on in the community. There's blueprints out there. So I know it's being talked about. We just wanted to throw that out there. It's something we've got experience with, and, and we'll look to participate when the time comes. So a few parting thoughts. The credentials are the keys to the kingdom, right? They're, they're among the most important things that you've got. So you've got to make sure that you protect them. Threat model your deployment. Watch the credentials, whether they're keys or passwords or whatever it is. Watch them work their way through the system. Look at every interaction. Think about how they could be attacked and how you can mitigate it. 
securing your use of Keystone is going to be an ongoing process. Right? Everybody's deployment is a little bit different. Everybody's got different considerations, different production, different tools, different services. Um, so we want to do that threat model, and then every once in a while, when you change your deployment, you add some services, you maybe upgrade Keystone, dust off that old uh, threat model, update it, look at the new interactions. And then finally, share. Right? Security is a team effort. And this is the team, right? It's the community. So ask yourselves your own questions. Um, share with us the questions you're asking, the things that you're thinking about, the solutions that you're deciding on, um, maybe the solutions that you implement. Um, and uh, again, feel free to reach out to me or others in the semantic team. Uh, that's it. Any questions? Hi, I'm Adam Young with Red Hat and uh, Keystone Core, and I just want to say this fantastic presentation. Really, really got a lot out of it. Um, and I took notes. Um, one thing I'd like to, uh, I, I think you might have oversimplified on the statement where you said, uh, you know, change the standard locations and stuff like that. Um, I'd like to put a caveat on that, which is, Use SE Linux, and if you use SE Linux, don't change the standard locations because what's going to end up happening is you're going to have to manage your own policy. So, I think what you said is in a vacuum a really good uh, piece of advice. But understanding that when you deploy Keystone, uh, especially under HTTPD, which is the the, the approach that I highly recommend, um, HTTPD already has an SE Linux policy for securing port 443. You don't want to put that on a non-standard port and then have to deal with telling HTTPD how to deal. You don't want to do SE Linux unless you're ready to commit some, some time to it. But I think the, 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 the concept behind the advice is really good. Um, you, um, with, when you uh, talked about Radius and, and the, uh, the ability to externalize the authentication, um, one of the things I was wondering if you'd looked into is, you know, again, with HTTPD and the ability to use the external uh, auth plugins, um, if perhaps that, that might come closer to what you're looking for, that you let HTTPD say who you are, and then Keystone's job becomes more what you can do. Have, did you investigate, like, along those lines? Yeah, we, so our, our auth team, um, you know, separate, our, you know, the, basically the, the VeriSign auth team did take a look at that. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about it a little bit more. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. And I, actually, let me just point out that Adam has a killer blog out there. Thank so you. I was talking about, um, about resources that are out there. Adam's blog is one of them. It's, it's not just good information. It's actually a really good read. So maybe we'll talk, and, and that will become a, a post. And to, uh, to address your last point about share, um, it would be great if we could see um, Symantec uh, you know, on the code reviews, on the design reviews up front for the stuff that we're talking through. If you guys could come on over to the Dev Lounge, participate there. I'm assuming you, you're planning on it, but I'd love you to get the, the shout out for, okay. for doing it now, and that would be great. Sounds great. Yeah, I have a question about uh, what network is used, data, manage, data network or net, uh, management network. Is there a use case where you can use Keystone uh, on the data network. Uh, and I had another question about uh, uh, multi-region support in Keystone. How, how, does this, how does that work? What was the second question? Uh, multi-region support. So how, do you, how, how does Keystone support multi-region deployment? Um, see, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, maybe Adam can respond to that. The question was about multi-region support in Keystone. No. It sounds like it sounds like they're still working on it.
Okay. All right. Let me let me try to uh, just to summarize that. It sounds like there's been some work done at the API layer, but there's still underlying functionality that's still being worked on for that. Uh, okay. Try now. So when you say uh, multi-region support, I'm assuming you're talking about the um, ability to annotate on an endpoint which region it's in? Is that what you mean? Yeah, so, so if your services are distributed across multiple regions, right. then does the key store, um, are, the, are the authentication tokens sort of replicated? Does that? Um, across multiple keystones? Right. No. No. They are not. Okay. Um, and our goal in one of our design summit sessions here is to get rid of having to persist the tokens altogether. We want to move to ephemeral tokens. With PKI, there really is no need to go back to Keystone to, to validate them. So if we can get it such that um, a, two different Keystone servers can issue tokens independently and without sharing keys, because obviously that's a bad practice, stuff like that, um, then what should be able to happen is it doesn't matter which one you get it issued from. Everybody should be able to authenticate, you know, validate the key, the, the tokens. Okay. Is that what you're looking for? It's on my roadmap. <laughs> okay, okay. So another, so sort of my first question, I wanted to sort of talk about the use cases for using key store uh, or the data network is that, uh, I mean, typically, when you do this uh, service level uh, token uh, request or authentication, you're using the management network. Is that, is that right? And is, are there use cases where you're building services on a stack and you want to make use of key store? Is that, does, that, does that work? You're talking about you have uh, um, other services outside of OpenStack that you want to provide authentication to using Keystone? That's right. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, Keystone is a basic, it's, a, it's, a, it's got its own identity provider pattern that you can plug um, various things into. As a matter of fact, we've done it ourselves. We've added services um, to OpenStack uh, and used Keystone as the way to log into them. And you know, this, you know, particularly this new one, MagnetoDB, that we're working on, it's not yet OpenStack core, but you plugs in just like any other OpenStack service does. Would, would you agree with that? No. Okay. Um, and the reason I say no is not that you can't do that, but I kind of feel like you shouldn't. Um, one of the patterns that we're seeing time and time again is that um, Keystone's role has, has shifted over time. Originally, it was a central point for um, passwords, so you didn't have to replicate them across all the different OpenStack services. And what we've seen is people already have their own identity providers. Uh, people already have LDAP, or people already have this way of managing. If you're any non-trivial organization, and we're trying to get out of the business of managing passwords, and trying to make it so that if you have some other service out there, use a standard, like the, the, the list that you had up there, like SAML and, 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 and Kerberos for you know, um, the enterprise, uh, X509, client search, whatever it is, a cryptographically secure way of authenticating it. And think of Keystone's reason for being as an additional layer of authorization on top of a secure authentication layer, okay? So you should not have to go in um, and make your application Keystone aware unless what you want to do is tie in with the role-based access control view of the world that Keystone does in and say that the roles that I'm going to use are going to be consistent between this application and, say, Nova. Yeah, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, I think it, that it, it's, it, it seems like maybe the division is, um, are you providing authentication to something new that you're providing to your customers as a service? If it's a, a service similar to you know, the way you might provide Nova or you might provide Swift or something like that, then certainly that makes sense. But if this is you know, something for your own back-end authentication where you could just as easily use something else, um, that would make more sense. Use, use, this, use the standards and the, and the cryptographically secure auth authentication mechanisms where possible. Okay, thank you. All right. Great. 
Thanks a lot. Thank you.